name, but price them at Solder. Then wow. I, I, I asked him why. Because, yeah. I mean, it's, it's just a it's normal Yamaha. It's an FG150, yeah. but it's 60s AC. No, yeah. it's the aging of the, the wood. the age of it. Right. And the age of it. And he said it's still in perfect condition. Hi, Andrew. So good to have you here on the Worship Luthier channel. Thanks for agreeing to this interview. And I'm excited about all the interesting things we're going to learn today. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Thank you for the invite. No, it's, it's my pleasure. It's yeah. my pleasure. Um, I did a bit of research to see a little bit about your background that I wanted to share with our viewers. Um, and all I could find was a few items on the LinkedIn page of yours. So yes. you were an SABC audio engineer in drama, continuity, music and sport till 1993. Mm. Um, director and owner of a private recording studio producer, engineer, and music arranger till 2000. Um, then worship pastor, director at Harvest Christian Church until 2014. Uh, and then you also were a broadcast engineer at HBS Brazil World Cup in 2014. That's pretty impressive. Um, and then the most impressive part is you're married to Ingrid yes. for how many years? 45 years this year. 45. Wow, that's amazing. And also the father of Travis and Dwayne. Yeah. So I'd like to go back right to the start. So where did your musical journey start? How did you first become aware that you had a musical talent or wanted to learn an instrument? In actual fact, mine's a, a, bit, a bit of an interesting story. I was probably 11 years old and my dad in the backyard had filled bottles to different levels to mm -hmm. have a little, you know, you, you take a stick and you play yes, a little tune yes. on it. So I was always playing on these little bottles. And my elder sister, who's 11 years older than I am, um, she noticed that I had some musical talent, you know, playing mm -hmm. like, like this. And um, the next minute she said to my dad that Andrew's got a musical talent. Although as a little boy, even before that, about seven years old, eight years old, I was singing... Um, the song Let's Twist Again, like we did this summer, mm -hmm. at the Kings Beach stage. There used to be a sound stage that every December you could enter a competition and you would sing like a talent show. Right. Right? In those days there was no television. Well, mm -hmm. So there were stacks of people and I'd get up on the stage and a lonely little boy and just sing Let's Twist Again, okay? <laughs> and I'm so glad there were no videos in those days. <laughs> Nobody We'd could see it. We would have loved to see that. No, I really don't. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and then, um, so, so music was there. My dad played guitar every Saturday night. We would take out a black book and he would sing on top of Old Smokey and stuff like, like that. And my mom played piano a little bit. And yeah, but coming back to mine was that my sister eventually said there was something about this. So the figure I can't remember, but I know she went to spend something like a, one rand 20, one rand 30 rand for private piano lessons. And mm. it was quite expensive in those days. So I went to a wonderful lady that um, I've got to give credit to her and the teacher. She was in Mill Park and she had a school called Mary Matthews School of Music. And there was a teacher called Mrs. Morris. And she taught, which was unheard of in those days, she was taught teaching syncopation. She wasn't teaching, and she called it modern music and syncopation. So it wasn't classical, all that type of stuff. And uh, so I started taking lessons. And what she always did, she would teach you music. She would do the theory and all that, but she would give you a melody. So you could go home and say to your parents, um, listen, I love this song. This is the song I play. Okay? Mm. And uh, this really grew on me. And in our days at school, boys never took piano because then you were a sissy. You know, you didn't, you didn't, so you never told anybody that mm. you were going to do this. Mm. And uh, so I played rugby to cover that. I made sure that everybody knew I was a tough guy. And I would take piano lessons, you know. And my dad, the funny part of the, my dad's side of the story was um, they said I needed a piano. So my dad said, no, this is a, a passing phase. And so instead, this is now when I'm 11. So my sister went out again and she paid 50 pounds, which was a huge lot of money, 
for a Bora Beetle rotten piano, which my dad wouldn't allow in the house because the house would have been eaten up alive by the Bora Beetle. <laughs> so we put the piano into the garage. Mm -hmm. So I practice at night in the garage, in the freezing garage, and I play, and my dad always said, oh, well, it's going to be a passing phase, you know, a young little boy is going to go. And this Mrs. Morris, um, till the age of 15, I think, um, I took lessons with her, and her husband passed away, sadly. And I said to Mrs. Morris, uh, she said, I've got six months left until she moves away. And I said, won't you teach me everything you can possibly can that I can go away with? And she taught me just about everything. Never went into the jazz field, which I was quite sad that I really didn't. But I loved the jazz chords. I eventually had to teach myself a little bit. And she taught me stuff and she left and I carried on playing. And uh, then at the age of, I think I was 13 um, or 12, I can't remember the age now, um, on my birthday, uh, there was a, door, a knock at the door and I opened the door and there was a delivery guy and he, there was a massive truck outside the house and this delivery truck guy said, uh, I'm looking for Master Andrew Kreef. Remember in those days the young people called? Mm -hmm. So I said, yes, I'm Master Andrew Kreef. And she said, well, I have a parcel for you. So I said, okay. I went, phew, quite a big truck for a parcel. You know, so the door opened and he had this brand new Yamaha upright piano. Wow. Got delivered. Brand spanking new, made in Japan, beautiful piano, which today still plays as good as the day it was bought. Mm. And, and that's how I started. And the irony of this thing is that the one who was my greatest fan and listened to me most of the time playing on the Saturday and Sunday and in the evenings after school was my dad. Mm. My dad loved sitting in the lounge listening to me. So the passing phase he thought was going to happen Never passed and yeah. carried on, used it, used it in a band, used it in a touring um, worship band and then worship today. Yeah. That's amazing. Um, tell us a little bit about how you got involved in, in worship in a church context. Uh, interesting that about out? that, I had a band, if I told you the name of the band's names, the two names you... Uh, you, people watching will probably fall off their chairs laughing. <laughs> we had a band, a little band, where we were young, young guys, and we even had our names put on the sash. You know the sash you put across yourself? Yeah. It's got the name imprinted on. And the name was called, just don't ever blame me for this, okay? Psychedelic Phenomena. <laughs> I thought it had a nice musical ring to it, you know? <laughs> And I'm sure it was I, amazing in the day. But it was like you were the, the guy. You were up there with the Beatles nearly, you know. Psychedelic phenomena. Psychedelic phenomena. phenomena yeah? you, it never leaves your mind after wow. you hear it, you know. <laughs> and I remember us going to play at schools and stuff like that. And then later in our um, school, uh, um, four of us, four guys, friends of mine, very good friends of ours, we started a band called Magnet. And uh, it was just drums, bass, electric guitar. I played electric guitar. And uh, the guy played rhythm, and the guy played bass, and then we started doing dances and functions and that sort of stuff. So that influenced the musical side of the band issue. Mm -hmm. But in that walk, um, my wife's brother, Graham, was, uh, we were at school together from sub A. Mm -hmm. The real joke of it, if you look at the school photograph, the class photograph, Graham's sitting on the very far left, I'm on the very far right. Mm -hmm. But we didn't know each other then very well. So we, we became friends and athletes together and everything. And Graham was radically saved. And Graham was part of the Salvation Army. And he had his own worship band. They had their own worship band of which my wife sang in. And Graham lived across the road from us. And one day it started where he said to me, man, we'd come visit. And I'd come visit him and we'd be friends and play sport and rugby and that. And um, he was in the opposite house that I was and all that. And we um, eventually asked me, why don't I come play drums? So I said, okay, fine. I went down and played drums for them um, a few, few times. And then I had to play the piano. So the worship side of it, and something I always found so interesting was, how can these guys do this and they don't get paid for it? Because whenever we did the gigs... <laughs> We got paid, although the bands in those days, we were paid like 75 rand a night for the whole band. And that was pots of money. Mm. I mean, when a young guy gets 70 and you divide it amongst four, by 
uh, four of you, it was like crazy. What do I do with this money? It went you know? a long way. In those it went a long <laughs> way, okay? Five rand to fill up the car and that, that mm, sort of thing. Mm. So, so anyway, uh, Graham um, influenced me that way and I would just watch this. He was, he was a guitarist and he, he could sing and he harmonized. Yeah, he had one of those beautiful voices, just a natural musician. And uh, that's how the influence came. And I watched mm. how these people worshipped and how they sang and uh, performed worship songs. And it, didn't, it wasn't something on my agenda at all. I was, part, I was part of another church that uh, we were doing hymns only. Not that there's, mm. there's anything against hymns, but that style of worship wasn't there. So that was my influence. And then the sad part, in a way, was that 16 years old, we were setting up for a worship event that night. I was going to play guitar. He was going to play guitar and the drummer and bass. And... Um, um, one of the freak, absolute freak things happened. There was an electrical issue in the building that we had that we were playing in. Um, in those days, there was no earth, earth leakage mm -hmm. like today. There was none of that in those days. You just hoped it worked. And unfortunately, Graham got electrocuted next to me and died. Wow. And that was quite a shock to us, to mm. us all. You know, this young guy, healthy as ever, he had played two soccer matches that, of, that afternoon. And he died in front of us. And um, years oh, no. went by and I sort of stepped away from everything. I didn't really get involved in stuff. Mm. But little did I know the influence he had in what worship is. And little did he know. So in turn, long story short, uh, went to the Defence Force, came back, all that. Um, saw his sister. Uh, we were good friends. And eventually we fell in love. And uh, we started a singing group with her dad, which traveled South Africa, um, Zimbabwe, all over, leading worship and preaching and reaching out all over South Africa for years. And that's how the worship thing started. Yeah. Wow, fascinating. Yeah. Fascinating <laughs> story. Um, tell us a story about how you got involved in the sound engineering side of the business. Oh. Um, you spent a lot of time at SABC and then seven years with your own recording studio. Yes. Yeah. So how did that come about? Um, the audio side was interesting. In those days, in matric, I don't know if you remember, or you're way too, you're way too young for this, <laughs> uh, we didn't have video very easily. So when they came around and taught you degree, or wanted to show you degree, no, not degrees, careers, yes. you know, yes. um, they would bring a film. You know, the guys would bring a film and they'd project it onto the screen and, and the whole school watches it, mm. you know. So they would show engineering, and those days it was engineering the bank. You either went to the bank or you went to, to go into medicine or you went to the post office or you went. There was a huge selection. And I remember this video clip or film clip of the SABC. And I was seeing these beautiful recording discs, I mean old ones in those days, and something stirred inside of me. And I didn't know, I didn't know how to even do it. In my home, in my bedroom, I had an old reel-to-reel -reel, and I would record off, off air, you know, I'd record off air radio and I would edit mm -hmm. and make my own sort of music playlist, if you could put it that way, you know. Yeah. And I'd dub it over to cassette and I'd sort of, that was my hobby, little did I know. And... Um, Anyway, then uh, went to the Defence Force, as I said, didn't have a job, came back, well, applied for an SABC locally, and they said, no, no such job, no, it's not going to happen. Uh, went to work for two or three very interesting jobs. I often thought, oh, Lord, you had a sense of humour in this. Uh, mm -hmm. I actually was a, a checker, if I tell you what a checker is, on the harbour. Mm -hmm. We got to the harbour at four o'clock in the morning, yeah. And you would stand on the side of the harbour, berth, um, waiting for the ship to come in, and you would have a clipboard, and you would check the pallets coming in and count the stuff on the pallets. Wow. That was the checker. <laughs> and you were paid, like, top money for that, you know. So you worked from four until ten. A fascinating job. A fascinating <laughs> job, you know, very technical. You know, but, I would never, you know, never have guessed. No, no, never. And your maths had, had to be good, you know. So we started that, and then I remember working for the Labour Department. My dad got me a job as a, 
uh, a clock or something. And, and I knew God had a plan. When I think of it afterwards, I realized I would never have survived in the clerical and corporate, let's call it office work. I just couldn't. And I was very glad God showed that to me. But I didn't want that. No job whatsoever. And funny enough, um, the gentleman who tried to get me a job opening at SABC, he couldn't. Next minute he phoned my dad. He said to my dad, um, oh, no, no. There, then there's another funny story. One of my best friends who's in Canada, we apply for a telecom technician job. So we go down to telecom, we do the aptitude test, and we both get the job. That we can become telecom technicians. It's a three-year course, three-year uh, diploma. And you get it so great. Okay. So uh, everything comes. We're supposed to go to start the job on the Monday. And on the Saturday, I go to my dad and I say to my dad, I don't want to do this. And my dad says, <laughs> We've got you the job. You know, the opening, you're a student, you've got everything, everything's paid for. I said, Dad, I can't. I can't. Mm. So the real joke of it was that friend of mine actually took the job. Went very high up in telecom, did exceptionally well. And yeah, I was without a, with, without a job again. It just wasn't right for you. It just wasn't right for yeah. me. And the worst part was that in those days, if you went to telecom, you didn't have to go to the army because it was a key post position, you know. So yeah, I would chose to rather go to the army now. So my mother was not the happiest <laughs> person around. So I went to the army, did the year, which I was never sorry. And uh, at the end of that, I... Uh, came back, still didn't have a job with that. As I said, the guy tried again. And out of the blue, uh, a Joburg guy phoned him and said, there's a post in Johannesburg. And I moved to Joburg and I joined SABC in Commissioner Street. Mm. But Commissioner Street was closing down and Auckland Park was opening. So I was very blessed to be there when the probably one of the most advanced recording um, air blocks or um, institutions that opened up in the world second to BBC. It was the best stuff we'd worked on. Um, we worked on the most, if, the best equipment, the Neumann microphones, the Rupert Neve consoles, you name it, the Studer consoles. We, we were trained and then we had um, in-service training, which was based on BBC. So all the diplomas and stuff and courses were BBC written and written by local guys as well. So, because in those days, the universities offered none of that. You couldn't become a sound engineer. Mm. Um, you could go to UK. There were one or two few ones. You could go to Germany and study Toynmeister, which is a crazy degree. But um, that's how I got interested. And that's how the, the, the love of audio, I, I say this, and I say this often to younger guys, um, you may not become the most wealthiest person or you don't have pots of money in your life. You have enough and God blesses you with a great job. But the greatest part of when I was doing that career, I jumped out of bed every day. I wanted to go to work because every day was not the same. You can't bring your ho work home with you because you couldn't bring the stuff <laughs> with you. In those days, you couldn't pick mm. up the Mac and bring it home and edit. Yeah, You know, we were doing all of it there. Uh, we worked on two-inch um, multi-track recorders and all was analog. The word digital didn't exist at all. Um, so it was a great, uh, I love doing it every single day. The hours are very long. Um, the patience you've got to have is because you're working with uh, musicians. And of course, musicians are always easy people to work with. <laughs> you know, they don't have temperaments or anything like, like that. There's no arrogance. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so, so I was able to work with a lot of people and it mm. taught you a lot on patience and uh, endurance and that's with the audio and then I was asked, uh, I was really blessed, a businessman that I didn't know and he didn't know me, I didn't know him mm. but he eventually found it from me and he, uh, I'll keep it short, he just phoned me one day, he said come and have coffee, I had coffee and he said he really felt God had in his heart to open up a recording studio. Mm -hmm. And I said, okay. And I told myself, Ingrid and I sat down, we prayed about it, and I thought, you leaving the SABC. Uh, we were seeing already the crumblings of the SABC, the, 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 this massive corporation that was an extremely wealthy corporation, mm. good to their staff, good to every person, 
no matter what you were, color, creed, whatever it was. Mm. Uh, but we watched it crum crumbling. Things stopped happening. And um, then he offered me this record, beautiful recording studio built in, in Newton Street um, with everything I wanted. Um, right acoustics, um, top of the range analog desk, which a year later we got the second digital desk in South Africa, the Yamaha O2R. Mm -hmm. uh, we were the second people to get them. We were recording digitally on ADAT mm -hmm. machines and DAT machines. Uh, we had editors, which nobody had. Um, so I was very blessed. I, I never, and I always say the, the partner that I had, the financial partner, and not just financial, um, he was very kind to me. And um, yeah, he, he, had a, he had a passion to push Christian mu music as well. So he invested into a lot of Christian music. And yeah. Are there any notable artists that... Um, you recorded back then? That yes, um, I recorded uh, quite a few of them. I've got Ken J. Larkin, some people must remember, a lady that became quite big in South Africa, Maria Hayward. Um, I recorded also a lot of classical recording, um, mm -hmm. something I always loved. Uh, Well-known quartets, trios, organists from overseas. Um, uh, I'm trying to think of other artists that I did. Uh, we did often um, musical items for shows. So we did backtracks for shows. I arranged music for artists as well. Um, so, yeah, it was... I, I was very fortunate to get some Joburg work because uh, a lot of the work's there, of course, and in Cape Town. But I got some Joburg work. And, uh, yeah, and, and I was very privileged to work with... Um, yeah, with Many from um, the first year, actually, I landed up doing a lot of the Burmese competition. Mm -hmm. um, landed up doing a lot of that. Did a lot of choirs, mm -hmm. um, some of the black music choirs. There was a great, well-known conductor, uh, Zondle Matthews, highly respected man. And I remember him bringing this choir in. How we got the choir into the studio was a miracle. And uh, we just did phenomenal productions, and he was just mm. a very good producer, you know. Mm. So I worked with a lot, a lot of that sort of thing. I've been very privileged when I did make a list of my recording career of it. Uh, one day I realized that there was not one type of music that I had never recorded. Mm. Uh, even um, we had a touring group of Indian musicians doing Indian music, you know, mm. with tablas and harmoniums and all those, you know, all the Indian instruments. Yeah. And we never get that shot, you know. Mm. And they arrived and they wanted to do a couple of albums, a, a couple of songs. So, yeah. yeah, I had this, you know, stuff I'd never looked at, you know. Wow. So I had a lot of that. Um, yeah, and I, as, as I say, classical music at SABC, we were very fortunate. We had two Steinways in the studio. Mm. So all the Rhodes University music students would all come and do mm. recordings and quartets and I see mm. trios and stuff. And, and some radio uh, jingles as well, I think. A lot of radio yeah. jingles. I love doing those. Those mm. are one of the nicest jobs ever. Um, mm. It's quite demanding if you think of it, a, a jingle is normally 30 seconds. And uh, sometimes the client <laughs> wants to say as much as he can in the 30 seconds, which is wrong. We proved that to the client. We try and get that to the client's point of mm. getting their telephone numbers is a useless, completely waste of time. Waste of time because <laughs> mm. you've only got 30 seconds. The guy's mm. not going to write the number down. He's going to go Google the number, you know. So get the name of the company out. That's what you've got to do. And then you get uh, donut jingles, which is even harder. A donut jingle is that you've got a top and tail and you've got a blank in the middle. And the blank in the middle is to put your specials in. So your top and tail is going to be really good. So you as the listener driving in your car must go, um, let's say I'll pick on the word spa. And it, you, you must know in the first second, this is about spa. Mm. And this is what's happening. And so, so at the end, it must remind you that it's spa. Mm. But it sounds easy, but it's not that easy. <laughs> but I loved doing that. I would sit and compose, tune, and to write a, 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 a what do you call it, a, a hook line so the guy can sing. And the guy mm. sings, he just sings the tune. 
You just know, today I find there are very few good jingles written that you remember the tune. I remember mm. the days. You remember, you could say, hey, that's from this. This is from Checkers. Hey, that's from here. Mm. Today it's um, hardly ever. You, the, the, it's, there's so much wording. There's so much. So they don't seem to waste time in creating the identity of that was the actual company's mm. uh, tune. If I, yeah, if, if there's, if there's a, a total th a signature that's, that's, to it. Yeah. And that there's seems a, to have died. To it. Maybe it's what the, the marketing industry likes, you know. Mm. But yeah, I, I, I love mm. those. Mm. So those mm. were great times, yeah. So after that, you, you went into full-time ministry um, at Harvest Christian yes. Church as the worship pastor slash director. Yes. So tell me how that happened. Now, the interesting part of that is that Ingrid and I were the worship pastors for 12 years prior to that. So we were part-time, um, unpaid, not on staff. So while we were doing this crazy life of little boys and SABC and all that, we were still at the church running the worship team. And there was a stage at Worth the Harvest where we ran four services. And when I think back, I always say to Ingrid, how did, how did we even, I can't even, I lose my breath when I even think about it, you know. Eight o'clock service, ten o'clock service, half past five, half past seven. And you were playing and, at every service. And we were playing and then I would do two and maybe two in the evening. And, and uh, we ran a worship team then um, of about 60, 70 people. It was crazy. I often think, yeah, Lord, and why, why did we do that? You know? Oh, that, that's a big team. But that was just the crazy stuff. But it was also the tech guys and the dance team. and it, So we had wonderful times. We've got wonderful memories of it. Mm. Um, but the 12 years we were there, and then Pastor John Cole called us, and we went full-time. And uh, I remember sitting with Pastor John, and after we'd now agreed and everything, and he said to me, I said to him, John, I, I haven't been full-time, but can you by any chance tell me the hours? Because I come from corporate and I know you can come in at 8 o'clock, or although at SABC it was shifts, you know, you're working evening, a lot of the music recordings are at night. Mm. So John said to me, oh, the hours are fantastic, Andrew. So I said, oh, well, boy, that's great. I thought he was going to say you work on Sunday. <laughs> you know, six days you sit at home in front of the piano, you know, practicing. Because mm. that's the picture I must have had. And he just said to me, ministry is 24-7. Sure. And um, I learned that, Ingrid and I learned that very quickly, that it is 24-7. You are called. Mm. Um, that's why I say to many young, or not just young people, um, it's not a job. Don't think it's a job. Um, don't think it's an eight to five. And don't think it's a Monday to Friday and you have your Monday off. As they say, pastor's Monday off. Um, you are called to um, shepherd people, to disciple people, to help them to be there. Yes, you've got to watch your own time. It's a very important mm. thing in ministry. Guys do burn out very easily. People do. Couples do. Marriages get under huge stress because it's just ministry. Mm. And they forget about me, you know, us. Mm. So it's something that I had to realize. I had to manage time because to me... Um, it was about serving the kingdom. Mm. And, and I say this with, and I hope it comes across correctly, um, and I shared this, that uh, you're not serving your pastor. You're not serving your church. You're not serving a specific group of people. You're serving the kingdom. And if you get that right, that you're serving the kingdom, mm. all those other things fall into place. Mm. But if you're serving this one man or this one thing or this one way, you're going to burn out because, as you always say, people let you down. Mm. Um, you, you can build this person or build these people and you go, oh, my goodness, that's not, that's, that's not what I thought. Mm. But if we really try, it sounds easy what I'm saying, but it's not. We've been in ministry 24 years. We've got to focus on serving the kingdom because mm. he will never let us down. Right. And when those wobbles come and all that, you've got to know, okay, Lord, that guy's just as human as me. Um, let me just keep on working. And it's hard. Mm. It's hard mm. at times because we often think people are. Uh, and let me say this as well in ministry, maybe to those out there in ministry and think I'm, I'm, I'm guilty of it as well. Ministry can often be extremely lonely. Mm. Um, and I say that not with a guilt thing. I'm just putting it out there that 
you can become lonely. You as a couple, um, you as a person, because you are constantly giving. You're constantly giving. And um, you you have to guard that. Mm. And uh, yeah. Mm. And, and so ministry is great. It's to watch people grow. Uh, we sometimes have the great privilege of seeing the, the fruit. You sometimes don't see the fruit. Mm. But sometimes, and you know, you will, somebody will see the fruit. Mm. What's that great saying about you plant a tree now that you may not see the fruit, but somebody will reap the fruit. Mm. Mm. So I've always, Ingrid, I've always believed that, that we may not see the fruit always. Mm. But when you do see the fruit, it's just so encouraging. Mm. You know, mm. when a, a young boy who came to visit us when he was in matric with Dwayne, or he was in school with Dwayne, and a um, young, young boy and sort of wondered, you know, where he was going, what he was doing and everything else. Oh, and eventually he left school and didn't know. And he became a top youth pastor. And he's in the UK now and he's flying. Mm. And that fruit, he was in our home and we had input mm. in his life. But you sort of never, yeah, I wonder if he was, if anything's going to happen to this guy, you know. Mm. And I'm always proud of that. England mm. always go, yes, that's yeah, one of those. That's amazing. Yeah. And I think we've got to, not that we look for that, but we've got to hold on to those. Because mm. it's an uh, affirmation to the Lord, from the Lord saying, hey, just keep on doing this. Stop, mm. you know, don't give up. Some of the fruit, you're not going to, mm. you're not going to see the fruit. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure there's been some interesting experiences as well, some crazy things that have happened. Do you want to share any stories? Yeah, no, we've had some, yeah, we've, um, I've, I've, yeah. <laughs> I think you were, you were talking about, you know, my recording days, and I've, I've put right. that into the worship days as well. Um, there was a great, um, a, a prophecy spoken over Ingrid and I many years ago. I mentioned the lady's name. She's passed away quite a while back, but the most precious, powerful lady, Kerry Saudi. Um, she's mm -hmm. very well known, those that know her. Very powerful, very solid, very balanced. Um, yeah, just There was never controversy and all that type of thing. She was really good. And she came to speak to our worship team one day. And we had this whole worship team, and she started, uh, at the end, we said to her, Kerry, do you mind doing some uh, prophecies just for the team? And we, we, we stood next to her. And she came up and the team sort of came up one, one by one and she read their mail. It was like as if she lived with them because mm. we knew them personally mm. and she was that accurate. You know? And I always thought, oh God, it gave me such encouragement that prophecy, it always, the word says don't steer away from prophecy. You know? right. And sometimes um, when we use the word, I believe the Lord's saying, it means you, you are really saying, listen, I'm trusting God. This is a word for you. Mm. And it says, go and test the prophecy. So if I'm wrong, you don't take it personal and say, you spoke about that and it failed. No, no, no. The word tells you to go test. Mm. You know? Take it to your, el your elders and talk about it. So she came and she spoke over us. And she said something. Knowing, didn't knowing much of my background, she knew my excellence, my push to make things right. Everything's got to be right. Because I felt if we do something for the Lord, it's got to be well done. Mm. And there was a saying, which I don't know who quoted this, but I've lived by this, that excellence inspires people and honors God. I will go to my grave with that. Yeah, that's Because beautiful. it does. When you, excellence honors God mm. and inspires people. The right. best example I have is when Ingrid and I had the privilege of, of traveling a little bit and we walked into those European or British uh, cathedrals. And I realized that these guys grew this. They built it right. to honor God. That mm. was the purpose. Um, the guy died often building it. But he built it to honor God. And mm. today they're still there. You know? yeah. So to me, I've always said um, that's something I've been very strict on in a way. Um, you give your best. If you can't, I'll help you. I'll train you. I'll guide you wherever but don't give me half um, I've got no unfortunately I've got no patience for that I see that you not really into this but uh, I'll play a guitar a little bit you know like I said to one one guy you speak about that when he uh, a guy said to me one day I was watching him play and uh, he kept on playing the chord of F wrong every mm. single time right and I thought okay I'll give him a shot show can you show him what F looks like maybe Eventually, I said to him, have you ever gone away and just fixed your positioning on the chord of F? So he said, no, it's fine. It sounds okay. 
Mm. Now, you're saying the wrong thing to me <laughs> completely. So we did fix the cord of mm. eventually, but it's something that I, I believe the excellence in it as well. Right. And uh, right. so, yeah, um, to me, yeah, that, that thing of, 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 of doing it right, um, giving God your absolute best is probably the best thing that mm. I can do. And the funny stories are um, where the one Sunday morning, um, there were two Sundays that I will never forget at Harvest as long as I live. Uh, one of our singers, a male singer's best voice, beautiful voice, about to do a solo item, walks up, grabs the microphone. He's got an SM58 with a cable plug plugged in, grabs the bottom of the microphone too tight so the cable falls out. But he doesn't see the cable falling out. <laughs> I'm busy playing piano in those days and I'm looking at this and I realize there's no cable. And he starts bellowing out in this opening solo part of the song. And there's no sound. In those days there weren't in ears, it was just monitors. The rest of the team saw it. How my wife survived was they were paralytic, okay? <laughs> looking at this, a sound guy lost like 10 years of his life. <laughs> And poor old Barry, who was the guy, wonderful, gifted singer, sang, and he realized there's nothing. So he thinks it's the sound guy that switched his mic off. I'm shouting across the piano. The church is watching. This is a moment. Mm. You know those moments? Yeah. And I'm saying that eventually he looks down at his microphone and he realizes the mic cable the fell cable out of the floor. <laughs> so he gently and very politely Gary goes down, picks up the mic cable, and he plugs plug it in. I look at the band. And I do this and you start the intro all over again. <laughs> and he just sang. And then the other funny one was um, one of our other singers was standing to his le to the left of the stage one Sunday night. And God's Spirit moved in the place. There was a great anointing, God's presence. And there was a trumpeter next to him. Hmm. A trumpeter was, was busy playing. And he was the first singer and then the next four. And I was busy playing and leading worship. But out of the corner of my eye, I see this guy walking down the side of Harvest's wall. Mm. So I think immediately that he's going to come up and kneel at the altar and, and pray. That's what, I'm, that's what I'm thinking. But before I could even speak or think a second later, the trumpeter is like lost in the anointing playing the trumpet. The guy sees, standing there, he's got his eyes closed because everybody is now in this moment of worship. And this guy walks up the stairs towards the worship. Team. And I'm like, I start panicking. My drummer and the bass guy is like <laughs> hyperventilating. We try to think, is this an attack or what's this guy doing? And he walks up, but determined. Eh? This guy walks up and he stands in front of the first male singer. He walks past the trumpeter which was an ex-policeman, which I was hoping he was going like, to stop the guy. So he walks past the guy, I guess, yeah. and he stands just about nose di distance away from him, stands away from him, I guess, and he puts his arm around him and hugs him. Hugs him. <laughs> wow. But the singer didn't, doesn't know it. All he knows is this, you know, you can feel when somebody's close. So he opens his eyes and he has this guy right in his and he gives him a hug. You know, I think the singer must have wow. lost 10 years of his life. Wow, and I mean, the that's... blood drained from his face. <laughs> I was on the piano and I was finished. How I sang that song, I think I laughed. I, was, I couldn't cope myself. And we finished the evening and the worship at Optus. And I think we never, after that, I nearly said to the guys, we need bodyguards at the bottom of the stairs. <laughs> So we've had some, we've had some interesting times, yeah. But uh, yeah, we've had some good times, funny times where uh, where God uses stuff in such an amazing way. I remember doing a Saturday night meeting, and when Pastor John took over, um, about I think it was a year into his ministry with us, he asked that he wanted to do a Saturday night soaking meeting every Saturday. Hmm. So remember, we weren't full time. So hmm. I said to him, "Great, I'll do do it." And we got the team together. And so I did it with John for two years, every Saturday. Mm. Every Saturday we did it. As well as leading on Sunday. As well as leading on Sunday. Yeah. But the Saturday, if you tell me which one you want off, I'll say Sunday. Saturday was just, it was a, we used to call it a watering hole. 
and we wanted a watering hole for the church. Uh, I mean, for the city. Mm -hmm. um, we still have it on a Saturday night, on the first Saturday nights, but it was a watering hole for the church. That was the word given to us. Yes. And uh, Pastor John had that sentence of, he took the scripture where it says, um, I can't remember where it is, where it says, uh, be filled in the spirit. But if you look at the Hebrew, it says, be refilled. Mm -hmm. In other words, be, keep on being continuously filled. That's filled. Continuously. Continuously. Right. Yeah. And he said, that's what it is. It's mm. a, a, a times of refreshing. That's what mm. John Eco called it. And we had people from the cities came to sit there, ministers mm. from Afrikaans churches uh, that I knew well. And I don't say that, that they came because it wasn't their type of music. But they came and they would sit in the right at the back, right in the darker areas. Just And when I went to one of them, one day I said, why are you here? And he said to me, Andrew, I'm here just to soak it in because I'm preaching tomorrow. So we were so blessed that God used that, mm. those nights to impart to people, to refresh people. We had no agenda. There was no sermon there. No, we didn't have, we, we got there, we had prepared worship, but sometimes we do, of the eight songs I choose, we do two. Um, and one, one, I'll share one precious moment was the one night we were, we were singing, and it was about 10 past 6. Never forget it as long as I live. And normally those nights we'd get about 300 people plus, easy coming in. And uh, we heard this harmony, and I was busy playing harmony. And I had a second keyboard playing though those days. And we had the singers and bass and drums and everything else. And I heard this male harmony. And I knew that the guy behind me can sing harmony beautifully. Tell you what, we were carrying on playing, we had monitors. And, and I heard this harmony, and no matter where I went, this harmony followed me. And I thought, sure, you know, Blake, so the guy that used to be one of my worship leaders. So I said, you, I thought, well, so Blake, you're really smoking it tonight, boy. There's just not a note out. Yeah. And I carried on playing, and I turned around like this to look at back, just to smile at him, to say, you know, you could see that. And Blake's mouth was closed, completely closed. But Blake's eyes were like this, big eyes. So, okay, fine. Carried on playing like this. And I, no, how, how many is here? I thought, no, I've got to be hearing it. So I'm looking at the back and I'm thinking, my sound guy's got a microphone. <laughs> and I'm thinking, maybe John's got the handheld microphone. He's also seeing. No, John's there. Okay, fine. The sound guy, no, I oh, know. And I hear, we carry on going. And it started in, as I said, 10 past 6. Why, I remember, we did the old Hosanna Integrity song called uh, Be Glorified, Be Glorified, mm. Be Glorified in the Highest, you know. And we carried on this. And I noticed I couldn't end the song. No matter how much I tried to go to the next song, we carried on playing. And even the band looked at me, sort of going, you know, okay, we've sort of done this now, you know, it's mm. not over. And I couldn't, I just, just carried on going. The singer just carried on. Ingrid looked at me and we know each, we've been ministering for 50 years together. And she knew there was something going on. I just carried on going. I carried, carried on singing, carried on singing. And people started to fall in the spirit and people started to just, you could see God was doing, and nobody was talking, nobody was mm. doing anything. This harmony kept on singing. Mm. And again, we carried on going, carried on going, okay. So we sang the song, if I remember, for about 25 minutes. Easy. We just kept on, kept on, kept on. And eventually we click, go to the next song. Fine. How many stays there? Gone. So I thought, okay, we finished the service just after seven. It was only an hour service, about an hour and a half or so. We finished eventually that night. So we, we get up from, I get up from the chair. I used to sit and play in those days and get up and chair and I go to the, get all the team together and I said, yo, the guys, did, did any of you hear that harmony? And Blake said, Andrew, I heard it. And he's an extremely talented musician. He said to me, Andrew, I heard it. Crystal clear. Now, we had five different monitor mixes. So you couldn't say it was just on the one. Hmm. So his monitor mix had it on. He said, Andrew, I heard it clear. It wasn't me. So, okay, fine. Ingrid, did you guys hear it in the front, the girls? Yes, he heard it fine. Go to the sound guy. So I said, listen, I know you're a, you're a muser. Could you hear another male harmony? No. I said, fine. John, could you hear something? Else? No, he couldn't. So I said, okay, guys, all I'm saying, I know that there was a voice with us. I know it. 
Yeah. I'm not saying you all witnessed it, you heard it, everything else. And then elderly gentleman, he was well in his years. Uh, in harvest, you know, as we had these weird three steps, big steps, mm. like an altar type of thing, that right. people would walk in. And you could walk up the side. And this elderly guy came down the aisle and he was weeping uncontrollably. And I thought, he's probably coming for ministry or, or something like that. But the service is over now. So he walks up and he leapfrogs on these three steps. And I thought, yo, he's the type of guy that would have gone this side. Mm. walks up and he says, Andrew, Andrew, Andrew. And there are tears that run in. He said, Andrew, Andrew, can you, can you remember? Did you see it? Did you see it? And I said, no, what? Now we're all sitting there. We, mm. We're all sitting. He said, did you see it? And I said, he said, you, you, you know that second song, which was this big rock glorified. He said, that second song, did you see us? No, what did you see? He said to me, as you started to play, there was an angel behind you. Wow. And I still, my hair still today gets up. And I said, did, did any of you guys see it? No. I asked Blake, who's standing behind me? So he played behind me. Blake, did, did you see it? No. John, did you see it? No. Sure. Rob, did you see it? No. And he saw it. And he was a gentleman that had been in harvest. Is highly respected. Not even, if I can use the word, not even that way inclined. Mm. He just experienced a supernatural vision of some of a su super being. Incredible. And he came and shared it. We heard the voice. Mm. So we walk out there dazed, dazed, completely. Mm. We can't speak. Those. Now the shocker comes. <laughs> the Tuesday, I used to belong to an email group around the world. I think it's still going, called the Elijah List. The Elijah List in those days would send out prophetic words to worship leaders all over the world. It was an incredible, encouraging uh, um, tool. Mm. Don't know about now, I haven't received it in many years. And uh, the Tuesday, remember that happened on the Saturday? The Saturday, yes. The Tuesday an email comes in. The top of the email says, in Zephaniah 3 it says about God singing over us. Remember right. it tells you yes, that? Yes. And if you go and look at the Hebrew for Zephaniah 3, the the singing over us actually means that he danced over us like a top. That's how crazy it is. It's not mm. just, oh, I'm just going to sing over you. Okay, <laughs> He really worships over us. Mm. So it says there, 793 says, God, will, God sings over us. But during this season, God will sing with you. Mm. Not just over you. Mm. And I took it to the worship team. All right, guys. Just prophesied, and look what we have in Saturday. Mm. And it changed our worship team's outlook to look for the supernatural yeah. during worship, probably for the rest of my life. To wow. say, Lord, show me what you're doing in the room. Yeah. Maybe nobody else will see it. Mm. Maybe my team will see it. Maybe I will see it. Maybe I can, because God is moving so mightily in your home cell, in your wherever you are. There can be three of you. There can be a thousand of you. But we miss the supernatural happening mm. in our room. Yeah. You mentioned your wife, Ingrid, many times. Um, can you just share a little bit about how you, you uh, minister together in the worship ministry? How does that work? I think, I think the point, uh, she had a huge influence on me knowing that I wasn't into this. You know, I watched her minister with her brother and then we were part, part of a group. And the funny part, I played piano for her. So for all her solos, I would sit and play. Mm. I still thought she was a very pretty woman. So I thought, gee, if I could only marry her one day, that would really <laughs> be the first, the first prize. But it was interesting how, how it happened. But, but it's, it's something that we have always enjoyed. It's something that we've shared um, there are times we've always ministered together. Um, wherever we go minister, no matter where it is, a small town, a big church, where, wherever it is. There are times I'll be teaching um, on worship. So I'll teach either to worship leaders. Um, she's always present as well. Um, there's something she and I, and, and, and I've got to give credit to Ingrid on this because she started something in our worship team was um, 
when you've got a team and you've got, let's say for argument's sake, you've got 60% men, okay, and they, they, they're committing to a Tuesday night and they're committing often to two services on a Sunday, sometimes one, uh, and they're busy and they sometimes there are productions and they work in with the band and everything else. Um, she found it was so important that she ministered to the wives of the worship team members. So, because the wives are sacrificing that time, you know, the husband, and often at, in those years we had a lot of uh, wives with small kids because we had little kids, and we realized that it was often tough. And we found out the minute she cared for them, and when I say cared, they would get a get together once in a while. She would have them on a group and she would encourage them. Or she'd send them a scripture or they would talk. And so although you can have people part of your, um, let's call it, uh, we call it connect group or life groups or whatever, you're not interfering with that. You're not, you're not uh, replacing that. But because there's your husband or your wife, um, she would look after the husbands and I, uh, I would, but let's call it wives now, the other way around. Um, you then looking after that person, and, and she, that person also sees, well, my connect leader's looking after us, but the wife of the worship pastor, she looks after me. So we had a buy-in, we had a commitment level that was phenomenal. I mean, I really I honor those people for the rest of my life that served us when we were there. Um, because we just noticed that we made it important that the family is involved um, and that the wife felt that, hang on, I can, you know, she would encourage the wives to pray for the husbands when they're at practice and stuff like that. So it wasn't a burden, you know, of this thing. Ah, what are you going to practice? And I'm stuck at home with the kids and that type of thing. So that was something that, that she started and it, it had a huge payoff to us. Um, where I, I picked that up, not she knew that that was just something she did. But what I often, I read in a book years ago, a young guy, I can't think of his name, wrote a quote which really stirred me when he said, they are people before they are players. And I thought, oh, what does he mean by that? Then I understood what he meant. Um, so many times in worship teams, or worship pastors, um, not full time. Okay, so I'm now working still. I've got the same pressure as the team member and everything else. But I see Trevor as a guitarist. You are my guitarist. You are my gifted acoustic singer harmony guy. You my so I only see you as my guitarist. It's all I'm interested in. Okay, I don't see Trevor. So when Trevor's in a bad place. I'm not really interested. I want Trevor, the guitarist. And I found that, and I say this because we've traveled around a lot, and unfortunately, sadly enough, worship leaders or worship pastors, we are guilty of that. We're interested in getting the band going, and we use the word, the C word, so easily. It comes off our lips like this. We say, but where's your commitment? But where's your commitment? When, when we ran the team for those 20 some years, it was, um, I used the C word on the first Tuesday of the year. I only used it once. Never used it again for the year. I said, I want you to go away and pray. Do you want to be committed to the team for the year? If you feel that you're not, you can't, you, your pressure's too much with everything, I, I release you and come see me again later. Um, you obviously pray that that doesn't happen to all, but there were times we had, I had a wonderful story of a, a very high, fly, a, a high court um, lawyer in my team, and uh, he was having a massive case in the high court, and he said, Andrew, can I take three, three months off? And I said, of course you, you can. I said, it'd be great. And my condition always to taking three months off was, or taking time off was, I said, I, could, I will release you, but I want to see you in church. Because that's the trap. Well, I'm out of the team now, so I'm busy working, which is fine, because that's important. Your work is, you know, it provides for your family and all of that, very much so. But I don't want to, I'll, then, well, then I'll miss church and I'll miss everything. So eventually, three months later, you know it. 
you know. So it's something I, I always asked. I didn't demand, I just asked, please, I would like to see you in church because I know you're getting fed. And I remember this guy taking three, three months off and he, he was a highly, highly committed guy. And about a month into this case, I see him come back on a Tuesday. So I said, and now? Yes, he did the case. Did you lose the case? You know, always the thing over. He said, no, 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 no. I got it all wrong. He said, I miss this way too much. Tuesday night fills my soul. I've got to be here. I'd rather work out late, late to some other time. It blessed me so much to hear that. Now, I didn't ask that. It came from him. But I realized that it was so important that we make that commitment thing of, of, of how I'm involved, when I'm, what is expected from the team. So Ingrid was very, very good at that, being part. They also, the team, saw us as a couple. Uh, we were running Sherwood team. They, they must see you as a couple because you have women and men in the team. And there are certain things a woman will not come share with me. Um, but although they've got their connect group, and I always say I'm always very careful never to step on toes of another leader. Um, if they've got caring and sharing, whatever, um, and also on the pastor's job, you've got your senior pastor or whatever, he's got his, whoever looks after. But because they're part of the ministry you leading, you also accountable to them, even if it's 10 people, six people, whatever. Um, so that's where she helped, and that's where the husband-wife thing became a powerful thing. We had an interesting scenario that when we did our big productions in the opera house and church and wherever, the roles were changed. Ingrid was then the director, and I was the music director. So I was under her. So some, some people found that a little bit odd, mm. you know. Um, and in turn, you'd go to, and we would make it clear to them. Just remember, the final thing stops with Ingrid. It's her position as the director of the show now. Uh, some guys went, oh, that, that's a little bit weird. You know, but at the end of the day, I saw the production musically. She, she saw the production visually. And there were how many times, if you were in our home, but I, I would come home after rehearsals in the early starts of the production and say to her, that's never going to work. Never. I don't even know how you're going to get it right. It's not going to, you can't move this, you can't get that, you can't. And she'll say to me, Andrew, believe me, it's going to work. But I'm seeing it musically. So I'd arrange all the music, I'd get the band together, I'd score the music, I'd get everything ready, ready, ready. And I think, okay, forget about it. If, if the donkey can't get on the stage, I don't care. I can't worry about that. If this can't work and this set can't work, and lo and behold, the week before, while we're doing final dress and doing stuff like that, the lighting, everything just comes together. And I realized the giftings we have, even as husband and wife, what your wife has is different to you, but you complement each other. That's the secret of complementing each other. Uh, you, you, you cover each other's weaknesses. And I find that in the early stage of our lives, it's not like that always because the young couples you just want to go, you know. And as you get older, you realize, um, I always when I do weddings now, I always say, it's two imperfect people coming together. Um, you know, it's not. And when, a, when I hear a young bride say, well, he's got some issues, but I'll change it when I'm married. Then we'd all just burst out laughing. I said, do you know that you're not going to do that? Talk about it now. You know, this is the moment. Mm. So, yeah, that's where we've, as, a, as mm. a couple, we've been very blessed and we've traveled. And, uh, yeah, and, she's, and she, has, she has a gifting as well with uh, ladies, with women. She has a unique gifting of um, walking, counseling, but also just talking. She's got a unique way, which, is, which I'm very blessed about. If you said to me, are we going to ministry? I would have laughed at you. I never, it wasn't on my agenda. Never saw it in my plan of my life. Never did. Mm -hmm. So I know, I really can say it. I really, truly can say it. Mm -hmm. If I never met her, and I ne when I came back from the army, if I never caught her and realized that I know I would not be in ministry today. Mm -hmm. Because her influence of a pastor, she came from a pastor's home, but just the whole thing of how she was brought up influenced me in the spiritual side in a huge way. Yeah. Mm. 
Let's talk a little bit about your two sons. Mm. Have they caught the musical bug at all? Yes, they 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 both. Geez, well, let me tell you, it goes to the it goes to my sons and to my grandchildren. Like the genes don't have a chance. So they don't go. <laughs> you know, if you're not music in this family, you're gone. Eh? It's like, and it's quite interesting because it doesn't always happen. You have right. those families where it's not. Uh, my eldest son is the worship pastor with his um, wife Shay in at Harvest now. Um, she, the irony of that story was that Lachey came to my studio when she was 11 and I recorded her voice and then I did her second album. Um, she, uh, little did I know she'd be my daughter-in-law one day. And I still thought, what a voice. Oh, Lord, hallelujah. Imagine if she was in a worship team one day. I mean, that was the story we did. And then the funny part was she was uh, the soloist in the EP Children's Choir of which my younger son, Travis, was also in the children's choir. And Travis had a boy soprano voice that sang higher than all the girls. <laughs> so, and he used to always come home and say, yeah, you know, Dad, we're not allowed to come late. But then there's this one girl. She can come late and she never gets into trouble. Guess who that was? <laughs> Lachey. So it was yeah. so funny that they, yeah. they, they never knew each other. Mm. But uh, they were in the children's choir. And uh, yeah, so I got to know her and I got to know her parents and I recorded her album and did sound for her shows many a times. And uh, Dwayne, yeah, Dwayne was from a young boy. Um, listen, from a little boy to excuse her, take his mother's Tupperware pots out of the cupboard and play drums and have rhythm like pff, nothing. <laughs> um, Ivan Foster, the very first senior pastor of Harvest, he still boasted in Harvest. We had this big sonar drum set. And he would say, uh, we're the only drum, we have the only church in Port Elizabeth that has a drummer you can't see. <laughs> because Dwayne was only seven years old. Wow. He played behind the drums and you could only see the sticks sticking out. <laughs> and he played perfectly. Hmm. Uh, he played this massive kick. We had to put him on the chair hmm. and he just had rhythm. He was <laughs> born with rhythm. And uh, he could play, he took up guitar with Howard Nock and plays guitar, whatever he touches, he plays, plays bass, bass with our thinking, plays electric, took uh, up to grade, I think grade six in piano at um, Alex. They were both very fortunate to be at Alex um, during the time where Johan van der Berg was the music director there and he was just, he had a mm. supernatural gift with teaching the kids. So the two, the two boys were um, music. My other son in Holland plays piano, plays drums, plays guitar. Um, isn't part of a worship team. Was one on the island where he was as well. So music, you know, my grandchildren, my two eldest grandchildren, they both in the worship, youth worship team. Uh, my eldest grandson in Holland is at an academy, a music academy in, in Amsterdam doing stuff as a 12-year-old that you can't dream of, you mm. can't even sort of believe. The other grandson plays bass guitar, and the three-year-old, he plays everything. He knocks and goes mad. And, and my youngest one, Ariella, she's a bit reserved. She sings. And, uh, yeah, so the genes have gone on. And my, my, my boys, we're very, we're very blessed with the musical genes Ingrid and I have got. And... Uh, yeah, you know, music was everywhere. I think the hardest thing that happened to Ingrid and I was when Dwayne left to minister in Sedgefield to, to take up a calling. And three years later, Travis left and started work in the UAE. And here was this house that used to have a drum set, guitars, piano, both high fives playing. It was never quiet in that house. The word quiet didn't happen. And yeah, Ingrid and I sat one night and there was nothing. <laughs> you could just hear the crickets outside. <laughs> and, Quite I said an to, and I said to her, talk about empty nest. <laughs> right. This is like a whole other level. Mm -hmm. Because our house from always was just music. you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. today, even now, when the grandchildren are there, they are there at the piano. There's a drum set in the house. And mm -hmm. So yeah, we're very, very blessed. Uh, I think a tip I can just add to any parent whose children they think might be musical, Sometimes you may not be, or the gene might have missed you, and your dad was. And I always say to somebody, 
no matter what your child asks for, get let them try it. Mm. Travis's first instrument was violin. And I thought we were killing 10 cats every day. <laughs> he was, man, it was rough. And we listened, and I remember if I ever hear the tune Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star again, I'll lose my mind. <laughs> so he was trying to play Twinkle, Twinkle, and Ingrid and I, we looked at each other. But what happens today, you don't have to buy the instrument. We rented it. So he played, and we thought, no, this is not going to work. And then he said, Dad, trumpet. I thought, oh, God, we're going from one to the other. And a side note is that Ingrid came from the Salvation Army. So she plays piano as well. She can play brass instruments. Of course, she can play the horn. She can play cornet um, because that's what the Salvation Army mm. plays. Mm. So I thought, okay, there might be a bit of hope for Travis to play <laughs> trumpet now. And Travis took this trouble. We bought it. No, we first hired the trumpet. And I thought, yes, we thought the violin's loud. Can you imagine what the trumpet's <laughs> going to be like? And we ate our own words. He got grade six in royal schools in trumpet. Mm. And he prayed beautiful. You know, mm. even today still he's prayers. So those genes from Ingrid went that way. Yeah, you know? yeah. So, yeah, so I always say, let them try it. You don't know. Mm. Um, our grandchildren, they've tried drums. The ones doing, well, both uh, Ariella and Kaylee are doing exceptionally well at drums. Mm. Uh, Kaylee is grade six, rock, rock school already. Uh, Ariella is grade one. She's only seven. Uh, Taylor went from piano to, to guitar now. She loves it. Find the instrument that your child loves. Right. So often the parents don't. They say, well, you didn't like piano, waste of time, forget it. Uh, be like my dad, spend 50 rand on a broken piano. <laughs> you know, and then eventually you realize, hang on, this is not just a passing phase. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, you have a lot of parents say, no, we wasted our time there. And the child did have the instrument. I, I have a philosophy, and I, I haven't proven this, but I really believe it. I believe God's given every single one of us mm. music in us. I really yeah. believe it in, in, in my heart of hearts. Yeah, that's interesting. I really believe that, that yeah. just some have to be nurtured more. Yeah. Some have to be helped more. Um, I had a drummer who wanted to play drums in our band, and he couldn't play rhythm to save his life. So what I did, we had bongo drums. And I would stand behind him, hold his hands, <laughs> and show him what rhythm was, okay? Right. And I said to him, yes, you know, Rob, you really just, you haven't got rhythm, my friend. This is hope, hopeless. The joke of all that, he eventually got a drum set. He practiced. He played drums in our band. And today, he's a pastor in Canada, runs his own church, and he leads worship from the Drums. Drums, wow. So yeah. when I th always use his example because we just had the time to just help that. Because yeah. I believe every single one of us have, because yeah. music is so, the word is so full of music mm. about me. My other God, you must have given it. Some of us might have a lot, some of us mm. not. Mm. Um, and I've often said, uh, just try it. And then you suddenly, the person finds this gift to play, play something. Oh. So most people know you as a keyboardist. Yes. But uh, they, they're actually not aware of the fact that you play guitar as well. Yes. And you shared a little bit earlier about how you play electric guitar in yes. bands in the early days. Yeah. Um, you brought a guitar for us yeah. uh, to show us today. Why don't you get that out? Yeah. Um, and then tell us, tell us a bit about it. Well, um, the history of it. I'll, I'll tell you first about my electric guitars, quick, quickly. It was, you'll mm. find it quite funny. Um, in those days, we were able to buy guitars that were quite cheap. And I remember going down to Strand Music House and buying a stereo down guitar. <laughs> stereo. It was, that was fancy. I mean, you were like mm. the number one guy. I've never heard of it. But no, I never heard of it. I know, and of stereo. <laughs> it had four pickups, four little pickups like this, okay? Mm. And two jacks. Mm. So you could put it into your PA, you could pan left and right. Yeah. So your top strings came out the left hand side, your bottom <laughs> strings came out sure. the right. Sure, that's side. interesting. And you could mix the two as well. And it, it's quite a, it was a hollow body, quite a nice thing. I don't know why I sold the thing. I think they must have made so few of those things. 
<laughs> and I played it in the band, and everybody thought I was quite the bee, the bee's knees <laughs> with this thing. Um, <clears throat> and then I bought an Epiphone. I had a beautiful Epiphone, um, which I played el electric on, uh, which I hadn't played since. I hadn't played electric for years since then. I used to play all the lead breaks and all that sort of stuff. But uh, Ingrid always says to me, come on, just go back one once and while I said, no, no, that, that ship <laughs> sailed long ago. <laughs> so I uh, didn't do that. And then my wife bought me a, a beautiful um, a down guitar. Yes, it was, I sold it late and I never knew why. It was one of the most beautiful acoustic guitars I've, I've ever owned. And, you know, you often sell a guitar or you mm. sell something that you often wonder, you know, why did I do that? You yeah. know, and uh, so I had that. And so guitars, I mean, always at the moment, I've got a <clears throat> middle of the range court that I use. I use it specifically because I, I don't play guitar often now. Mm. I lead worship in smaller groups <clears throat> at times. But what I do do is um, um, I play the court because it's also light. It's easier to carry. Mm. Um, I've, I've got a Yamaha as well, which my granddaughter was, is using now, a bigger Yamaha. It's got to pick up everything else. But this guitar, we try to work it out, is probably just over 60 years old. Mm. And this belonged to Graham, to my brother-in-law. Mm. And wow. um, I inherited this when he passed on. Right. And um, I got it re restored because it was all the frets were very worn and mm. the pegs and everything else. And I had a, a session guitarist looked at it years ago. He came, um, Dwayne did touring with Louis Britt's band in Canada, the UK and US. And uh, the guy came and stayed with us two nights and he saw this thing. He said, yeah, <laughs> name a price and it's sold. Eh? Wow. And I, I, I asked him why. Because, yeah. I mean, it's, it's just a it's normal Yamaha. It's an FG 150. Yeah. But it's 60s. He said, no, yeah. it's the aging of it's the, the wood. the age of it. Right. And the age of it, and he said it's still in perfect condition. You haven't cut it. It's got nothing. It's got no cut, no pickups, nothing. Mm. Mm. And he just said, that's what we look for. We mm. don't. Mm. And it's I a still looked vintage there. instrument. Then. Yeah, and I said mm. to him, he said, it's an original. It hasn't been worked on. I said, no, it's just it had been, been restored. And, mm. and uh, so this guitar to me, the, the sad part of it, I hardly ever play it. I'm too mm. scared to play it in case it's it falls. The first time I'm seeing it. Yeah, so. and it's, uh, mm. so it's in, it's in, you know, it's, it's got one or two scratches which I'd never remove because it's obviously got a, a reason why. And uh, yeah, so I, you know, I, it's, it's still got a, it's a lovely warm. And then when he actually played it, only then did I listen to it, you know, because mm. when, I, when I, this is not a knock, but when I play my own court, mm. the same chords, I don't get the warmth out of it. The the, tone, you know, yeah. I really don't, that yeah. tone. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I've played, I love the chord. And, but when I played it, I realized, wow, okay, it actually is the aging and the wood. You as an mm. expert would know what the aging of the wood mm. is, you know. Mm. So this is average. We're trying to work out just now probably 55, 60-year-old guitar, you know. Yeah. Yeah, there's something about the way that the wood ages. It gets drier, but it gets gets more brittle yes. and more resonant as well. Yes. And it, yes. um, they, they, there are ways that they try and reproduce re that nowadays yes. you know, with, with modern wood yeah. through kiln drying processes. Yes. But yeah, there's still something special about yeah. the old woods that have dried naturally. Yeah, so I yeah. love this. The uh, guitar case is sort of saying goodbye to me. It's been around too long. <laughs> But yeah, it's something that I that I treasure dearly. And uh, you know, guitars. Uh, the other day, I had a twelve-string guitar, which I, I mean I've n never played it in decades. And somebody needed a guitar in a, a, a church where they had no guitars, and and I realised to myself suddenly, you know, I can only play one at a time. Mm. It was really one of those things. <laughs> and uh, I took the 12 string out and I realized I'd, I probably had never played it. Mm. And it was somebody blessed me with it. Beautiful uh, aria, very good condition, beautiful case, everything. And I said to the guy, yeah. And yeah, he sends a message to me. Yeah, he's playing it every Sunday, <laughs> loves it. Now, mm. 12 string, my fingers can't cope anymore. <laughs> and uh, it's like what I find so interesting. We talk about strings. Um, I use 11 gauge. Mm. And uh, I used to always laugh, this, the session musician that used to come and do my acoustic tracks in the studio, um, everybody who's watching will probably name uh, Timmy Smith, 
very mm. well-known guitarist, and he used to bring his original Ovation in, mm. and I'm talking of the original Ovations, mm. and um, but his tone was always better, mm. even when I had another Ovation in, and I'd say to Tinny when I said, "Yeah, well, you, you know, whenever you pick or you do those picks of like that, that uh, the mics I'm using the same." Neumann microphone or SM57, whatever. Mm. But your guitar just kicks it out completely. Mm. And he said, well, he plays a 13-gauge. Wow. <laughs> so I said, 13-gauge. So Dwayne, of course, grew up in front of Tinny and Dwayne's ear pricked up, you know. And I said to Tinny, but what sort of fingers have you got? Because my word, <laughs> even 11. I don't play often. So you'll notice I don't have any calluses. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah. So I bleed if I do a half an hour <laughs> session. And... Um, uh, then he said, no, he plays a 13. And then Dwayne throws his, and Dwayne's, uh, Dwayne's got a very expensive Takamini, and he plays a Taylor as well now. Mm. But the 13 gauge, it, it, it's just a different sound. Uh, no, that's the whole guitar wakes up. Yeah. But you just yeah. don't have the fingers for yeah. it, you know. <laughs> but I... I, I it takes I, commitment. I, n- I, I never realized how much... Well, I just thought mm. string and string, you know. Yeah. But yeah, I, I, I really learned something. Difference. It brings yeah. this tone, this deepness, this warmth yeah, yeah. Out, of a, out of a guitar that um, Dwayne always said, hey, I want to see all the 13 on this one. I said, don't you touch it. Mm. <laughs> but it's a, yeah, I never re- realized that massive difference. Mm. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, thanks for, for bringing it along. Um, yeah. As we, we sort of wrap up the interview, sure. um, there's three questions I want to ask, and I want to make it sort of a regular thing in, in mm. all my interviews, mm. because this is a kind of a guitar-focused mm. uh, channel, um, although you are primarily a keyboardist, but today we bring yeah. out all the guitar yeah. information. Maybe so the basis of music is on, on piano. Just <laughs> right if it wasn't for well, piano, there wouldn't be anything today. So anyway. <laughs> Although well, the word speaks yeah. about the liar, so I've got to be careful. Let's speak about the well, piano. Well, I haven't seen keyboards yeah. in, in, no, in no, the Bible. No, no, but I think the Hebrew missed out the word <laughs> piano there somewhere. Uh, I yeah. think, yeah. But anyway, um, the, so my final three questions to you. Um, I think you've answered the first one already, which is what is your favorite guitar and what makes it special? I think you've already answered that because yeah. this is a beautiful instrument and it has yeah. such a sentimental value for you as well. Yes. Yes. Um, my second question to Can you... Can I add to that quickly, yeah, if you sure. don't mind? Just one thing. When somebody, whenever I see people and I say, uh, or somebody wants to buy a guitar, uh, and they will, they will immediately say, uh, well, just listen to it. Now, listen to it plugged in through a PA or through an amp. And I'll always say to them, because from the recording studio side, yeah. We proved that. I proved that beyond beyond a doubt. So when I recorded an acoustic guitar, I would put there was a certain way I recorded them, but I'd put a condenser microphone here to pick up the whole. I'd take the feed out the back to go into an expensive um, uh, DI, you mm-hmm. know, and then I'd mix the two. Right. Okay. But what I did notice that you can get a guitar that sounds fantastic through the DI. You can also buy the what uh, the, 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 bags. the Errol Bags uh, pedal that makes any guitar sound great. Okay, right. but I always say to the person buying guitar, listen to the guitar acoustically. Yeah. What is the sound? Because it's yeah. the sound that right. comes out. So you often hear a guy playing acoustically, and the guitar is terrible. I mean, <laughs> really, you want to you want to cry when you hear it. It's just mm. it's just metal. It's not, mm. uh, uh, there's no wood. Yeah. You're just hearing the six string <laughs> clang. Uh, and even from an, from an engineer's point of view, you can't fix that. Yeah. You can't, yeah. it's done, you know. And, and then you take a, a guitar, not even a fancy guitar, mm. low range, another make, different style. Acoustically, you sort of go, yeah, wow. You, ha- you haven't even mic'd up yet. You haven't even mm. taken the DI out. And I know well, you know much more than this. It depends on the DI. It depends on the wiring. I mm. understand, you know, bridge pickup, wherever. But acoustically, I've always said, just listen to your guitar. Mm. If you're going to be playing through the PA all the time, yeah, okay, fine. Maybe you can say no. But a lot of times, most of your playing is going to be playing acoustically. Right. And then your acoustic sounds bad. Yeah. And you've bought a guitar that you need to carry a PA with every time. You know. Mm. Mm. So yeah. 
Well, that's that's a huge rabbit hole to go down when it comes yes. to acoustic guitar amplification. Yes. Oh. Yeah, I've watched so many hours of videos. I can imagine. I can, I can even, and I'm now right at the bottom of, of <laughs> and, I'm and, at the and, top of the rabbit hole. You yeah, know? we know that the best way to get the best sound is marking it up in a studio, yes. but I mean, yeah. that's not practical on I stage. Know. So that's totally where agree. the whole journey totally. starts. And then so, that, yeah. that rabbit hole, if you know how I mic up acoustic guitars, um, I get a sound out of them because I used classical recording with acoustic guitars. So I've been able to use and get guitars to sound, even the guy that owns it. I was, and it's not boasting, but I was just so privileged once in my life to be in Graham Sound Music Festival. And our last concert of the SABC was the Cape Town Symphony Orchestra. And their guest artist was Carlos Bonell, which is one of the greatest guitarists in the world, the classical guitarists. Mm. And he played the concerto de Angres, that beautiful piece of music mm -hmm. that every guitarist wants to play in their life. <laughs> and I had the privilege of recording this man who played on the, one of the most expensive acoustic uh, nylon string guitars. And um, he mentioned some things to me of what I could do, which was a bit unconventional. And we use it, obviously we have Neumann microphones that there's so many of them you don't know what to use them for, which was a great privilege because the SABC <laughs> had them. And we did them and that guitar, you could hear the orchestra, mm. but the guitar is the most beautiful sound I've mm. ever heard in my entire life I've ever heard. Mm -hmm. So I know if, if yeah. there's a good guitar, yeah. you can, but I know it, it's, a, it's, a, a, it's a huge rabbit hole, I understand mm -hmm. that, yeah. As, as a luthier or aspiring luthier, Put it that way. Um, I'm always interested in um, the, the guitarist experience. Um, so what they like and what they don't like about an instrument. Um, yeah. So when it comes to guitars, uh, what would you say is, is the thing that really bugs you the most about a particular guitar, whether it's the guitar you're playing or just guitars in general? Um, what would you like fixed um, in, in the guitar? Good. Uh Good question. To me, as is, I've seen where the guy plays a great guitar, but his method of playing destroys the guitar. In other words, he doesn't. In other words, he doesn't play correctly. So, I would say what frustrates me often is that I know the guy's playing a top of the range Taylor mm. or Takumi, but um, I remember, and I use this example, Duane could play guitar very well, very well. And he went to Howard Nock, famous guitar teacher, when the academy, we had the worship academy at Harvest. And they were all told to go and train under Howard Nock again, or, you know, go train. Mm. And I said to Duane, tell Howard that you can play, but tell him that you know nothing. Let him teach you again. Mm. And it was amazing how how it taught him the the different just 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 by moving this or just by doing that suddenly the the guitar came out because mm. the action was right piano is exactly the same yeah so to me the frustration as an engineer first of all is uh, and I can't often I'm struggling to to blame the instrument if you can hear what I'm going <laughs> yes. here because I've seen guys I've seen guys play on real low range, low cost guitars. Um, and the guy doesn't strum the guitar. Mm. He beats the guitar. Mm. Mm. So you can, you can hear it. And as an engineer, you can't fix that. Right. So his hand is solid. Yeah. So you can, he's, his arm and his head is just beating the living daylights yeah. out of the st strings. So, so right he's not technique. strumming. And it's so that makes it frustrating as the guitar because mm. I can go I can go I, I'm not a I'm a pl plectrum guy that's okay. okay I can go with a plectrum so I can go or I can go now I can play loud here so I know it's a bit louder but I change the tone of the guitar mm. and as an engineer that frustrated the living daylight sorry yeah because I can't fix it. So when I'm engineering and I'm trying to EQ the actual guitar, I'm going, it's not the guitar. 
Um, the other thing as well often, uh, and maybe it's not answering your question, or is that the guys will go through, especially acoustic players, they'll go through pedals mm. to fix the fault of the guitar. Mm. And I don't know if you get that right. I might be a rabbit hole thing, but <laughs> yes, you can. But often mm. I'm saying, yeah, okay. Rather get a new, a better, a better pickup, put it, you know. But uh, um, the guitars are, and there are guitars that are, I find the, the hardest guitars to work with, the toughest guitars are the shallow body mm. acoustic. A, what do you call them? Electric acoustic. Right. You know, right. the, the, the yeah. thin body. Thin body, yeah. I have, I've probably worked, and I can't remember the name, probably with one mm. that has worked fine. Mm. They all, no matter, no matter what you hit, no matter, I can't, get a, I, I can't get a sound out there. In the recording studio. I, I yeah. can't. And, yeah. and even live with a PA. Mm. I can't get a shallow body mm. electric mm. acoustic. You know, right. or I would call it electrified acoustic. Yeah. So it's not electric at all, mm. and it's a good acoustic. Guitar, but you often find the um, and those that own one, please don't take it personal. But <laughs> I, I, I think of the applause guitars, yeah, which was yeah. the Ovation copy, right. the Ovation yeah, um, entry level, yeah. and they lovely guitars. They work very well, but you've got to EQ them correctly yeah. to get the body out of the guitar. Otherwise, you've got to work on the, on the mid-range hectically to get yeah. that guitar to work. Yeah. So my final question is, um, money no object, what would be your favorite guitar to buy? I know you're a keyboardist, but let's just go with guitars. So only what one, be there's your only one guitar I would love to own. And you're probably going to smile when I say this. And it is a McPherson. Wow. I really I would. didn't expect that. that <laughs> that's a very that. modern instrument. I really, I had the privilege of doing sound and playing for Lenny LeBlanc, you know, mm. the guy, the song, the songwriter. Yes. Um, he came out here to Harvest many years ago and he did a two night concert here mm. and he plays McPherson. Right. And that's the guitar with the kidney shaped sound hole on the side. Yeah. I, I was. I was mesmerized by that mm. thing. And, and I've mm. heard Taylor's and they're all good, all that. Mm. And the second, but I wouldn't even say second, the same one in the same bracket, mm. again, never played one, but mm. did sound for it, it would be the Olsen guitar. Olsen. Um, right. That's one that Andre de Villiers uses. Mm. Um, he's the only artist I did sound for when he came to Harvest. <laughs> he plugged the guitar into the, he brought his own DI. Mm. And he came to the sound desk at the back and he said he wanted to see if the EQ was flat. Mm. And he said, yes, there's nothing in it. Any mm. com uh, compression, nothing. Mm. Any excitus, nothing, nothing. It was just mm. flat. We still had the analog disc. Yeah. He said, okay. Went to the front, plugged his guitar in, and he played. And you thought, what is in this room? <laughs> and, but then I hear it's worth 60,000, 70,000 US. It's a stupid mm. amount of money. Mm -hmm. But you can hear it. Yeah. So um, that one and a McPherson, mm -hmm. which yeah. I know we could dream about. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. That, but I think if I came down to a to to a lower thing, um, I am not because my son owns one. Owns one. The high end Takaminis I've always enjoyed. Prefer them to the Taylor. The, uh, the Taylor guys. is to me, and I say this as an engineer. Uh, uh, sorry, the, the is that there's a Taylor and there's a Taylor. So okay. the high end Taylor, the nine mm. series, mm. Uh, excellent. Mm. Can't mm. touch, can't touch. And we've got a guy that um, Dwayne often sometimes loans his nine series mm. when we're doing productions and stuff like that. And you can you you can you know, it mm. is a phenomenal guitar. Okay. I know it's got a wider neck. Okay. Which I had to get quite used to. I haven't played it, but I said, you know, this is quite <laughs> wider. Okay. And so it's very, very different. Um, but yeah, that's, that would be the, it's called it Reachable. I know mm -hmm. Dwayne owned a uh, Gibson Hummingbird. Um, right. He owned that. I did like a beautiful guitar. Yeah. Absolutely yeah. stunning sound. Yeah. Also those, you don't, you, you, what I always find, you don't, you, you don't EQ them. Hmm. They just, they just they, sound great. They, they just play. Yeah. 
you know. Um, I always, as, as I say, as a studio engineer, the challenge I always had was, how much am I going to fix in the mix? <laughs> you know, when a guy mm -hmm. brings a bad instrument is, okay, how much am I going to work after this right, to get right. this guy's acoustic to sound like something? You mm -hmm. know, so, yeah. Well, thanks so much for, Pleasure, for Trevor, spending thank this you. time with us. I really yeah, appreciate it. It was you. fascinating. Right, it was really you. interesting, and I hope our, our audience enjoys it as well. Yes. Yeah. Um, there's just one thing that I want to end off with, uh, and it's just a little bit of a fun exercise. So you can put your guitar mm. back in the case. Um, and I'm calling it the Slick Pick Challenge. Yes. Right. So I wanted to show you something. This is the guitar that I learned to play on. Okay. So it's a bit beaten up. Uh, actually I actually had to glue it together yesterday because it had cracked again. I had cut holes in it to put pickups, um, change the bridge, um, cut it in half. So this is kind of the beginning of my luthier journey. Um, and you see it's got F holes. Yes. Um, and as you know, as a guitarist, one of the worst things that can happen to you is you can drop your pick inside yes. the guitar and then right. you have to get it out. And yeah, if you're on stage in front of an audience, you have to do it as quick as possible. Yes. So this challenge is yes. getting the pick out of the guitar. And we're going to time you to do that. Okay, now my question right. is, now normally today you don't have that problem. Because on your mic stand, you've got 10 picks. You've got spares. Yeah, well, that, that, is a, that is a good way to go. So obviously this, was old, this was old school. Yeah, I could, I could I relate to this. To get I could this relate problem. to this way too many times. Yeah. Shaking and hoping and yeah. praying. And okay, whatever. But, but we're going to see how good you are at okay. this. And um, I know it's not popular anymore, but I still stick with the shark fins. I don't know. Nothing else, are. sorry. The younger guys say it will, will not be seen near really? a shark fin. No, you don't. But yeah, it works for me. Yeah. And I've worked, I've used I it for 30 years. I've always used a shark fin. I've used it for 60 and years. <laughs> sorry, sorry <laughs> guys. That's great. All right, so, so what I'm going to do is I've, I've got my, my phone here. <laughs> and we're going to time this, this okay. thing. So let's just get right. that going. Let's see if but I haven't got a second pick in my pocket. I, what I'm going to do is every time we interview someone, we're going to put up the, the leaderboard and see how oh, long you've oh, taken. Wow, wow. But there, there isn't anyone to compete against okay. yet. So I thought I'd go first. Okay. And then you go after right. that. And, okay. and is the final prize after a year a McPherson? Or a... Um, depends how well the channel does. <laughs> if it does really well, maybe. We, I might get a McPherson. <laughs> wow. Oh, I'm looking forward so, to this. So if you can okay, just I'll start press. and okay. stop. Um, okay, throw once it I, in. I'll throw it in, there it is in, and okay. we go. Go, okay, let's see if we can get it out. And this is quite tricky. Okay, where is it? It's Watch the glasses on the side. <laughs> uh, there we go, stop. Okay, so that's 14. Now, I think you've actually rehearsed this and a half seconds. Of course, I have to try it <laughs> first. All right, let's make a note to that. Okay, 14, 14 seconds. That's 14, good, eh? Let's say 14 and a half because you took a few yeah, seconds. No, no, I, I just think yeah, I was hoping at least. Wow, I'm All right. impressed, eh? So I have a second black drop here. Okay. okay, so we'll throw that in. All right. And okay, now it's your turn, and I will tell you when to, to start. Are you ready? Okay, go. Okay, go. Whoa! Six seconds. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So clearly you've done this before. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Too, too many rock band moments. Too many times. Yeah. That's, us, that's that experience in the rock band. Wow. Wow. Well. <laughs> yeah. Don't worry. This spectrum's all over my house. So okay. Yeah. Just so I, I look, uh, can I choose the color of the McPherson? <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. You're welcome to go and do that. Again, thanks so much for being Thank here you, and for Thank sharing you. your experiences yeah. with us. And uh, I'm sure everybody's going to enjoy this, yeah. this interview. Yeah. And God bless. Now, I just want to end off with this. I, for those that are, that are watching this, um, and this has not been, I've got, got no script in front of me. But I can truly say to you, Trevor, builds his guitars, not because he's just got a hobby or he's got a workshop here in the, in the garage. Um, he does it because he has a passion for it and he has a passion for music um, he has a passion for worship he has a passion to work with people and bring the best out in people so when you're buying a guitar from Trevor um, you're not just buying an instrument you're buying something that a lot of love 
lot of labor, a lot of prayer, a lot of God's guidance has gone into, and you'll have an instrument that will change your life as a musician. Thanks so much for saying that. You didn't have to do that. <laughs> but yes, I do, I do often pray coming into the workshop. And mostly it's, Lord, protect my hands because I don't want to lose a finger today. <laughs> Especially when you're working with the, the powerful imagine. machines. Okay. But yeah, thanks again. Pleasure. And I look forward to chatting again in the future. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Thanks.